Introducing Hard Candy Custom. Do yourself in a bigger, bolder way. Holly Davidson, USA! Create your own Hard Candy Custom motorcycle using HD1 Bike Builder. Then tell us where you'd go on your dream ride. Enter for a chance to win both. The bike of your dreams, the ride of your dreams, and the freedom to live cage-free. HD.com forward slash Marvel. Holly Davidson Motorcycles. No cages, no purchase necessary. Open residents of the 50 United States includes DC. Must be 18 years older to participate. Build your bike using Bug Builder. Then describe your journey in 50 words or less. See official rules for judging criteria. Contest begins September 3rd, 2012 and ends February 15th, 2013. To enter and for our official rules, visit h-d.com slash marvel void where prohibited. You might have missed the competition. Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast. Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of comics that include a member of the most underrated Marvel series from the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adjacent adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. Random, the original random banter, helps develop balance, movement skills, and coordination. Improves and harmonizes your child's trunk legs, and muscles. Made of super strong phyllite and latex-free vinyl. Random banter time, buddy. Talk to me, tell me tall tales, and tantalizing tidbits of trivia today. You were talking about that little horsey thing. Mm-hmm. That Bentley and Valor riding. A roadie horse. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's a roadie horse. Little converted roadie horse gets ridden around in this episode. <laughs> they do not have a commercial with song lyrics, just music. And I'm like, that's not what I want. Fine, let's just go to your promotional page and see what the owners of it call it. Roddy, original horse. Yeah, we're going to get in and talking about that real soon and explain to you our one or two listeners that still download and listen to our show. We know who you are. Thank you. We are going to tell you all about it in case you haven't read the issue. And you should read the issue as well, because it's quite adorable. We will get to that soon. But before we do that, I guess we'll just talk about a couple of random things. I have been watching a few different comic book themed TV shows that are going on right now. And mm-hmm. so, Jeff, do you want me to talk about A or P? I'm going to assume that A is Agnes all along. I'm hoping because that's what I'm going to talk about. Did you want me to talk about A or P? A. Okay, let's talk about The Penguin then. So, oh, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been watching The Penguin on Max, which is a direct send off from The Batman movie that came out not too long ago. And it is a reimagining of The Penguin more as a low level or mid level, I should say, mafia thug. And it is really darn good because it's more about the crime drama, storytelling from a villain perspective, but they're trying to make him sympathetic enough where you care about him in a little bit of Breaking Bad type of way. And it's really good. It's really nice to see an unrecognizable Colin Farrell. Oh, completely unrecognizable. I showed a picture of him to my wife and I was like, that's not him. Like, no. (laughs) It is. The makeup job is wonderful. The physicality that he brings to the role is incredible. His movements are perfect. And it's not a pastiche or it's not kind of a a send up at all. It's just a good characterization of a character. Gotta like that. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I want to. I honestly haven't seen The Batman yet either. Also on the ever-increasing list of media. But I did see an interview with Colin Farrell talking about it. You need to carve out about three and a half hours of your day in order to watch The Batman. No, I need to do lots of things with my time because <laughs> it's required elsewhere. Yeah, it's. I saw an interview with him and he was talking about he was trying to make the penguin like understandable. You can see where he came from. Not so much sympathetic, but you yeah. can understand how he became the monster that he becomes. And I thought that was interesting. I think it's really good. I really like it. I really enjoy it. And yeah, it's a good, good television, good, good media nice use of a character. So I'm enjoying it a lot. My wife is enjoying it as well. Kind of makes me want to revisit the Batman. I enjoyed watching the Batman the first time, but I heard some, a lot of people come back and say it's really better than you think it is. So I may need to give it another kind of look. It is really enjoyable. It's really good. It's something you should watch. Two episodes are out now at the time when we're recording this because we are a little bit ahead. So that's one of the things I've been enjoying. Oh, and also I went to Vegas for about 
a day and a half. No, that's a thing. Everybody does that. But not everybody watches TV. I didn't watch TV in Vegas. Oh, weird. But tell me about what you've been doing. Well, I have started watching Agatha All Along or Agatha of Harkness. Have you seen any of this yet? Yes, I have. Okay, I think I'm behind an episode of two. But from what I've seen, I'm like, huh, so this is the Alkalite, but done very well. <laughs> It has a group of musical witches. Okay. It has a alkalite Padawan type of character who wants to advance in the ranking. They're okay. fairly casual with the nudity at a spot. Okay. Is this sounding familiar? Is this the alkalite that I'm describing? Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. There is a lot less Jedi in the acolyte yeah. than in Agatha Hall. No, I can <laughs> see where you're going. Mm -hmm. I'd seen two episodes of it, and I was just like, this is hitting some story beats that I'm recognizing. Interesting. I want to see if Rick made this connection, because it's there. I had not. I'm trying to enjoy it while dealing with my family, who's also watching it with me. Mm. And my the two other ladies in my house are not fans of horror. Okay. And so whenever the show makes a little bit of a left turn into the horror realm, then mm -hmm. it's all, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And also, they are very casual watchers of TV. And yeah. Agatha All Along is a show that you kind of need to pay attention to. Because the beats in there, there's some interesting plot points that are just dripped and drapped throughout. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they make a turn and magic's involved and they're in a weird place. And so I hear a lot of, wait, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening. I'm like, would you all shut up? Yeah. Because I want to know what's going on, and I know up to this point because I've been paying attention. Oh my gosh, oh, this is just too too grotesque, and this is too scary, and I'm like, it's not, shut up. No, no, this isn't, this is Disney, this is PG horror. Yeah, no, I'm enjoying it very much. It is an enjoyable show. It's nice to see this. I've really enjoyed a lot of stuff Marvel's done lately. Oh yeah. But this yeah. does have a good throwback to WandaVision and what's coming next and what are they going to do next to us? So I, I like the uncertainty of it and I like the storytelling that's happening here. What I've seen of it so far, I have been enjoying, but I just really saw a surprise Alkalite parallel going on with some story beats in there and song beats where I'm like, oh, this is a really good song. Okay, I want to hear this song. And it was just funny to me. It's just like a attractive bladed stranger comes in and does some stuff. It's like, okay, this is familiar. <laughs> well, that may be familiar to you, but I think that the beer that I would like to give you is not going to be familiar to you. But before I can give you a beer, you've got to tell me what happened last episode. Black Bolt looks like he has to poop as he withstands the peacemaking process with the Kree's supreme intelligence, a peace process that is completely one-sided until the Supremer comes to its version of reasonable and they come to an arrangement. The arrangement being that the Kree and the Inhumans will stop trying to kill each other and live until the end of the universe, but Supremer wants Ronan and Crystal to break up because it is a petty little brat that doesn't want anyone else to have nice things. Now that the, while in the Inhumans' royal court, Spider-Man ran into an alien lady that his alter ego had a makeout session with, and then was upset when she said that she would remember his big round butt anywhere. Two sentence replay is over. Why don't you give me a beer and tell us what her power pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend. I want you to go ahead and reach in that bag and pull out those boxing gloves and tell me a little bit about what you think of my beer that I'm giving you. We have Rogue Knuckle Buster Cold IPA. <laughs> <laughs> I like rogue beer. Story time on it is dedicated to long nights and stripped bolts. It's a tan can with some red labeling on it. It's got a little uh, hamburger helper, big hand holding a wrench. Mmm, knuckle buster. Oh, let's see. There's some fighting in a cafeteria that goes on. Yeah, that's it. That's about it. Yep. There, there's, there's a fighting <laughs> going on in this book. There's a couple of good hits that are taken in this book. There, there's... There's a moose knuckle that gets busted. Yeah, there is. <laughs> so. <laughs> I bought the beers ahead of time and I kind of did a quick glance at this book. I said, yeah, this will fit. And then I read, really read the book and said, I almost want to go out and find a different beer for this one. Go out and find one called the Helmet or something like that, because yeah. I think that would have been a lot more appropriate. But that sounded like a lot more work than I wanted to give. And you're all the way across town. And, you know, I really don't yeah. like you that much. So Effort doesn't really pay for itself after a while. You can only put so much into it. It's a very yeah. 
fruity, juicy, aromatic IPA. It smells really nice. Award-winning craft brewery Rogue Ales and Spirits and celebrated Austin-based design house known for custom motorcycle builds, Revival Cycles, has partnered to release a new limited IPA, Knuckle Buster Cold IPA. Collaboration rooted in design incorporated both brands' passion for craftsmanship and hard work. The name Knuckle Buster was chosen to also pay homage to Gearhead's craftspeople from all walks of life and industries. Ah, there's another little mixture right there, too, because we also have gearheads and craftspeople. And yep. Val's a bit of yeah. a gearhead. If she can turn an old hobby horse into a flying machine, I'll give it to her. She's got a lot going on. Yeah, it's just packs of inventors doing things. AIM scientists and the wizard and the FF and the other FF and all the other things. That is a fairly hazy IPA. Yeah. yeah you're right. It does have the real nice fruit notes that you smell mm-hmm. in it. And yeah, those ta- those fruit notes go away when you taste it. That is a uh, got some g- dank grip on the tongue. That was that's a very hoppy beer from the nose on it. I was not expecting it to do that to my mouth. I am fighting my face right now. <laughs> that is a hoppy bitter beer. Mm. Six point one percent ABV and sixty IBU. That mm. sixty IBU seems a little low. There's nothing to really ah. cut down that really in your face hops taste. That is rough. <laughs> For you and I who don't like hops, this is a very yeah. rough beer. I'm trying it to get through very it. Rough. You, you were handling it a lot better than me. I am fighting my face. My tongue feels like it's a slug that's had salt on it. it but instead of creating mucus, it's just drying out. Ah, I'm fighting my face. I do have a glass of iced tea, a very sweet iced tea over here. So maybe that is helping to cut down the taste a little bit here. But wow. Man, I was thinking that by the time I... A lot of times the first taste is gets mellowed by the second and third. I've had like three or four drinks on this now, and each and every one is just doing the exact same thing to me. I don't know if it has a flavor. It just has a, a grip <laughs> on my tongue and palate. It has a lot of hops in there. It is mm-hmm. hops forward. There is fruit taste in there too there is some of the other layerings that go on here but this is nothing more than an ipa it is just an Mm. indian pale ale it is hops forward and it's there to say hello to you yep it is not gently saying hello it will not go quietly into that long good night it is pounding at your door at 3 a.m yelling your name Ah, that is that is hard it is called knuckle buster so there it is called knuckle buster yeah this is a it's a gearhead. You're a gearbox. You need, you're in need of some lubrication, and this is going to be it. Ooh, it is rough, but I'm going to drink the whole thing because I like my booze. But <laughs> rough. Not often, but on occasion. Sometimes you just go, it's going to be this kind of a day. <laughs> it is going to be this kind of a day. But what kind of day is it going to be? Well, the only way we can find out is if you give us the opening credits, if you please. FF, issue number 22, November 2012. You are whatever you want to be. Credits. Writer, Jonathan Hickman. Penciler, Andre Lima Arujo. Inker, Andre Lima Arujo. Colorist, Chris Peter. Letterer, Clayton Cowles. Editor, Tom Brevoort. Featuring, Bentley, Valeria Richards, Dragon Man, Wu, Vil, Mick, Kor, Turg, Tong, Alex Power, Onami, Mr. Fantastic, Invisible Woman, Human Torch, Thing, and Spider-Man. Move over, X-Men, in your stupid baseball games, the Avengers Academy and their lame flag football flops, and Spider-Man talking about his favorite minute rice. This is how real families relax, unwind, and use their powers to cheat at sports. And what game would they be playing slash cheating at? Ping pong. Really? Ping pong? It is the game of kings. No, that is chess. It is the game of nerds. That is D&D. It is the game of beers. That's beer pong. It is the game of love. Love? Love. Love? La 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 love. That's a song by Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders. <sighs> Whatever, Rick. Ping pong is the game that is rocking the FF rec room at the moment. The three moloids that are more than just heads are taking on Oname, and they seem to be losing. They go into a deep discussion about how their winning streak... Consisting of the four times total that they have played as Bentley points out, could be ending. Alex and Dragomen are reading the financial section of the Daily Bugle and half watching the game, or so it appears until Alex zero G's the ball, making Oname miss her return shot and costing her the game. His reasoning for such an underhanded play is only to save Oname from the inevitable dirty tricks that the Moloids would pull to get revenge for losing to her. You could say that Alex is playing some three-dimensional chess. At least it's not Pong, which is also a three-dimensional game. 
like chess. Val runs in to get her boyfriend, I mean Bentley. Something is happening that he may be interested in. What inhuman or unnatural debauchery has Val discovered on the internet that Bentley must see? Blue's Clues got into the Velveteen Rabbit Hutch again. Thank you for destroying my childhood. Again. Blame Val and Bentley. And also me a little bit. But mostly them, because they were the ones who created that content. Anyway, it appears that Val has discovered the new Fantastic Four mission. Reed has discovered that the wizard... Bentley's father... Er... And the sense that the wizard cloned himself a bunch, and Bentley is all that remains of the results. Right. Thank you for interrupting. Well, the wizard is on an island with a mess of aim scientists. That is, a sentence that is bad, and calls for some heroes to show up and end that partnership. And since the Fantastic Four plus one... Spider-Man are heading out there, Val wants to follow them with Bentley. She also wants him to wear a helmet. The only issue is, Bentley don't wear no helmets. Yeah, yeah, bad boy image and all that. No, I think it's more about helmet hair. But even though he says he does not wear them, Val makes him. Because her ride ain't no Fantasticar. Is, is that a convertible flying inflatable roddy horse? Of course it is. Oh man, I want one. An hour later, the two truant tykes have transported to the island, just behind the arriving Fantastic Four. Plus one. The AIM scientists are not pleased with this and are filling the air with chaff in order to take down the pesky heroes. Ba-boom! And they succeed, blasting the Fantastic Car out of the sky and forcing the five heroes into a ground fight. All of this action means the two kids on a turbocharged Toys R Us special are able to sneak in. From the rooftop, they watch the following action as Marvel's first family rolls through the yellow beekeeper attired foes, battling their way to the final boss, the wizard. Big Daddy Tech spouts off with some impressive light show and some big talk, trying to paint Reed as an ancient abacus arithmeticer while he is the cutting edge of future tech, right before he gets tranked in the back by his own aim compatriots. Flip, 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 flip. Flip. It is only your true friends that will stab you in the back. No, I think they figured out that the wizard's checks were not clearing. Bentley seems miffed that his dad was betrayed. Val points out that he is still moving. Flip. Okay, that last track shot at him was Val's, and it took the wizard down for the count. So now we move forward in time to see Johnny, Ben, and Spidey talking to the rest of the Future Foundation, that is not Val or Bentley, about what went down at Ames Barbuda Island Hotel and Resort. So, funny thing, Reed had been named the U.S. Ambassador ambassador to Barbuda, the AIM Island, so now the new director had to meet and greet with him. There is a bit of an argument about who resolved and who started a little scuffle in the cafeteria. Hint, Ben started and Johnny resolved it. Long story short, this was a long game by AIM to set up a treaty between the U.S. and AIM with the wizard as a present. And that explains where Reed, Val, and Bentley are. At Oz for a meeting with the wizard. As Alex says, Well, that can't be good. Meanwhile, at a poor man's Arkham Asylum, home of the fighting captured crazy villains, Reed tells Val and Bentley that he's going to go in first to have a chat with one of his oldest foes. He lets Bentley know that even though he came here to talk to his father, he does not have to do anything he doesn't want to. In the cell, Reed tells it like it is. Hey, wizard, you are broken, dude. Smooth, Reed. Smooth. Outside, Val is giving her little buddy a pep talk. And Bentley, well, he's nervous and scared as he looks at the box he's carrying. But as Reed exits the cell, Bentley walks in. Dr. Whitman, the wizard, is delighted to see his mini-me. And he, like us and Brad Pitt, want to know what's in the box! It's just a helmet. There could be a head in the helmet? Not now. Bentley brought a replica of the wizard's old helmet to try to help Whitman hold on to his sanity to remember who he was. Hasn't he always just been a mad scientist villain? Yes, but he was not always a crazy mad scientist villain. There are layers here. Like an onion. Yes, Donkey, like an onion. Okay, Shrek, but the wizard is not ready to skip back down that magical yellow brick road. He wants to bring the next generation into the family business. Bentley is his clone. He is the wizard. Put on the helmet. Join us! Bentley does not want to give in to the dark side of the force. Plus, he does not wear helmets. Okay, that sets off the not crazy, but oh, so, so crazy, crazy man. Dude starts ranting about how he made Bentley. Well, he did. How he is the god that created Bentley. Sure, I guess technically. How he put all of the thoughts into his head. Creepy and very illegal. Oh, and he then commands Bentley to put on the helmet and become what he was meant to be. So Bentley delivers his favorite greeting. A kick to the uprights. Wham! And a kick to the helmet, which is not a euphemism, but a way to dismissively move headgear out of his way. Reed enters to give a few parting remarks. Reed had promised that he would raise Bentley as his own so that he could be better than the wizard. And he has become better. 
Destiny is not set. Things can get better. We are not slaves to our nature, and he can be whatever he wants to be. Later! Val and Bentley are enjoying a sunrise, not saying anything. Val grabs the little bad boy's hand and tells him that he was awesome in there. Then Bentley ruins it by saying he loves her, and Val has to remind him that she is three years old. So yeah, that's a thing. But we also have themes of an issue, so let's move on, shall we? Jeffers! Rickers. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, so we have... Interesting cover here. It is done by Ryan Stegman and Marte Gracia. And this has a kind of a green mist with some Kirby crackle around it enveloping one part of it. And this is, there's a shadow, which we'll go ahead and guess that that's the wizard there. But there's a shadow of the wizard that's taken up the other part of the front frame. And inside all of that, we have the Future Foundation. We've got Val and Franklin Alex, Bentley, one of the Moloids and the two fish kids, and then Dragon Man's in the back. It looks like they're all finding the wizard, which <laughs> is a lie. I don't really like this cover because it, it looks cool. It just is not what the issue is about. No, it's not that at all. Val looks terrified. Everybody else looks fierce determination. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have liked to have something with like maybe the wizard's broken helmet on here. That would have been kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, or like Bentley nice. holding pieces of that broken helmet. Yeah. You know, something like that. Something to really tie it together. Because you don't know that that's the wizard. And none of these kids are really in ever that much danger. No. So, ah, uh, I, I don't I don't know what it's selling. You could have had Bentley kneeling down, holding a helmet, looking at it. Yeah. Like looking into the eyes of an empty helmet. That would have been really sweet and really tempting yep. about what this issue is and really speak to what it's about. So, ah, missed, missed opportunity. Missed opportunity there. I agree. And it even though knowing that the wizard is in this issue, I still don't see this quasi-armored, gloved figure being the wizard that's on the front. It's just generic humanoid shape. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can only put that together after looking at the issue and talking about it. Yep. So... The art itself is, it's serviceable. It's, I think that the artists really are some of the better ones of drawing kids. Are we talking about the cover or are we talking the about the... It's not a bad image. It's not a bad cover. I just don't, doesn't feel like it belongs for this book. No, and, it just doesn't tie, and, it doesn't tie in at all. And, and why do you ever have Val looking scared? Nobody yeah. should ever draw Val looking scared because that just doesn't happen. That's Especially with the powerhouses that she's with, including uh, energy crackle handed uh, Franklin. No, she's so, not afraid because she's Val Richards. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I know. I know that. <laughs> I know that Val would not have fear because she is Val. I'm just saying, even if she was just somebody ordinary, it would be along the lines of, oh, but I've got this team of these kids that are some of the most powerful beings in the universe. Not a problem. Okay. You kind of mentioned it. And before we get into some of the content. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the art. I think we've seen this artist before. This once again is Andre Lima Araju. He was the art, he's a penciler and the inker. And I I don't hate the art style. I just am not a fan of it. Yeah, it is to make a person a kid, you have eyes that are about a quarter of the size of your head. If you're an adult, you have normal eyes and children have saucer eyes. They look like giant squids. The majority of their features on their face is that. This artist is also putting Alex in the teenage years where he fluctuates around on his age in these comics for depending on who the artist is. He's getting a little bit more. He's lean, but he's muscular. He's looking more like he's about 17 in this one. So I think about what his age actually is. Nobody in this is muscular. Not even Ben Grimm. Ben Grimm looks like a potato in a sack. <laughs> There is no real musculature on any of the characters in this book. Just the way that this the way that this artist draws, which is one of the things I kind of like a little bit about it, is mm -hmm. he draws more while being cartoony. He draws people a little bit more realistic looking. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, cartoonish yet realistic. I understand. I, yeah. I get what you're saying. It's a tricky art style that's going on. It is a little hard to pin down. When I'm saying that Alex looks more muscular, he's got a little bit more definition to him. In no way is he beefy. He it no. is, It's a lot of lean muscle mass. That's kind of what these characters all have. Like you were even saying with like Ben. The, none of them are, are super CrossFit bros. They are just 
people you'd see in like photos from the 30s or something where it might be Dust Bowl depression and maybe they could use a couple more bites of their food, but they are what they are and they exist. To be fair, too, I don't mind the very really expressive eyes on the kids. I I see that as an artistic choice to demonstrate mm-hmm. that they are they're still exploring the world. It's kind of like the anime eyes, the big round anime okay. eyes. They're, mm-hmm. they're seeing more and trying to observe more and trying to take in more of the world while the adults are more cynical and their eyes are closed, more closed because mm-hmm. they have more of a direct line of what they know and, and where they're at in the world and they don't need to take any more in because they have all the answers. Yeah, because they've been exposed enough and have had their visions narrowed enough that they have the smaller normal eyes. I could see that. That's a good interpretation. I don't think it's quite what the artist was going for, but I like that interpretation. I, it's, I think it's an uh, it's a stylized choice that they have. It just there's a little bit of inspiration there, just a very little bit of of kind of a manga drawing style. But let's talk about some of the themes that were in this issue. I, I have something here called Destiny versus Nurture, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the things that is being talked about here. It's one of the age old discussions that Reed is having with Whitman about Bentley, having the discussion of can he, he take a literal clone of his, well, the wizard thinks he's his arch nemesis, but he's not Reed's arch nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> but can they take a literal clone of this villain and this insane villain and redirect the, that kid's energy to grow up to be something better than he was? Mm-hmm. And Reed's thinking, yes. Reed's an optimist. Yes, he is. But he's also thinking that Bentley's making great advancements. And he's even saying he's raising him as his own. Which you can tell because he's neglecting Bentley just as much as he's neglecting all the other kids. <laughs> There's a lot of work being done in the white spaces between panels in these comics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Between issues, lots of work's being done. But yeah, it is. My concept on that is you're a person, you have lived your life. You make a clone of yourself. I'm not even sure if Bentley has Bentley Sr.'s experiences and everything, or if it's just a template based on the physical basis of the wizard. But in any way, your clone is going to be moving along in a different direction because they're going to be having life experiences that you're not. You're not having the exact same ones. So the nature that you grew up in isn't going to be the nature that the mini you that you created is going to have. So there can be a change. As Reed is saying, he's like, I put him in a different environment. I'm giving him attention and doing things and he's becoming a different person. I'm, I'm impressed and proud of him. Yeah. There is the inherent nature of Bentley where it's like, yeah, I'm a bad guy and I want to blow stuff up. And I like kicking people in the groin and eating hamburgers. But he's also... Wait, wait, hold on a second, hold on a second. Are you suggesting that eating hamburgers is the way to evil? Uh, You never know. It's possible. I really want a hamburger. Well, that's it then. It's time for me to put on my black hat and go to In-N-Out, I guess. Yeah, that's going to be my origin story is, uh, oh, what turned him evil? He's like, oh, he went for a burger and then he was just bad, bad. You went for a burger and you ended up in the middle of falling down. What do you say? <laughs> All right. So there, there is a level of taking the life experiences that you get developed with in a, in a young child as their brain is developing and you alter the path of trajectory. You give them other things. Uh, it's the age old debate of family is still kind of going and watching through watching Smallville. If Lex Luthor was raised by the Kents, would he turn mm-hmm. out more like Superman? I would think yes. Yeah. Whereas if Clark was adopted by Lionel and Luther, would he turn out more like Lex? Probably. Because he would have been weaponized at a young age by Lionel. If I was raised by your family, would I have a braided beard? We got to see how your growth works. Okay. Your character growth of facial hair. Let's move on and talk about wearing helmets. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest with you that Reading through the book, I saw his comment at the big front, and I was like, oh, well, he's a bad boy. He just doesn't like wearing helmets. And I was really touched by the end of the book where we see the reason why he doesn't wear helmets. Yeah. He's already I- made the choice that he is not going to be the wizard. He is not going to be that guy. And how does he not become that guy? He doesn't wear helmets. I picked up on it right off the bat. In fact, I had added a line called helmet hair and daddy issues. And then we decided to remove the the daddy issues part. So that way it wouldn't spoil the reveal Mm -hmm. with the wizard later. But yeah, it is very much of the, when you think of the wizard, you think of a big dumb helmet. Yeah. At least I do. Oh, he also has like levitation discs and stuff. Oh, that's interesting. He's the one with the really big dumb helmet, right? Yes. No, no, you're talking about Galactus. Also the wizard. The wizard has quite the, the prominent helmet on, on his headgear. And yeah, so if I'm 
mentally associating the wizard with his helmet, then Bentley is going to be associating his father with that helmet. And it's very much of long lines of like, I want to not go down that path. I'm not that person. And I'm not going to do that. Whether it's conscious or subconscious, he did. hard to tell, but it is probably a conscious choice where he's like, I'm not that guy. That's not mm-hmm. me. And I'm not going to go looking like him more so than I have his exact same face. So, so there, this issue is a lot of talking about making choices ahead of time to alter the negative outcomes that are expected later on. Correct? Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and talk about the ping pong game because that is sums up the entire <laughs> thesis of the book without doing everything that the book does. The ping mm-hmm. pong game has the Moloids who are juveniles who are really smart but who are petty. And they are, they believe that they should be superior in playing ping pong. And even though mm-hmm. Oname is going to win, Alex goes ahead and changes the outcome because he knows what's going to happen. He knows that the Moloids are going to do something mean and nasty to the new person. So he would rather do something to prevent that and then later on have probably have a talk with her later on about why he did that. Mm-hmm. Just for her to not experience something negative that occurs. Yeah, unexpectedly. Yeah, let her go in with all the knowledge. Right. But he's doing what Reed's doing with Bentley. He's doing what Bentley has decided to do himself with making alterations to prevent things from bad things from happening in the future. It's an interesting parallel that Hickman has done here with a lot of the different parts of this story Mm -hmm. and how it all feeds upon itself. And I I really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Alex is doing a little hands-off parenting. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yes. It, ooh, tipping your hand, are we? Tipping your hand. <laughs> you don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about, or should we just dive into that final thoughts? I really like the fact that Bentley's always eating food. I think that's great, where he's just <laughs> casually just eating stuff. It's just like he's watching the ping pong game, eating a hamburger. Later on, he's eating something else. A couple of issues before, he was eating chips on Val's bed. She's like, don't get crumbs on my bed. He's like, uh-huh, crunch, crunch, crunch. I just respect that on him. It's neat to see a character do that. Bentley is mean. Bentley eats food at all times. And he kicks people in the boys. So that's what we know about Bentley. That's Bentley. That's Bentley. (laughs) All right. Let's get into final thoughts. Let's talk about the gallery of greatness. Jeff, what pieces of art in this book need to be pinned up on the wizard's wall in his new prison cell in not Arkham Asylum? What do you have? My... Backup joke one is on page eight of Marvel Unlimited, and I call it maybe lead with the force field, Sue, because this is the top third of the page is a panel where it shows the fantastic car getting destroyed by some anti-aircraft rounds, everybody flying and getting flung out of the fantastic car and Sue putting up a force field just at the last second to protect kind of the car and the occupants. So maybe she should have leaded with a force field, not go through this crashing problem. You superhero your way. She's going to superhero her way. All right. That's all mm-hmm. I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. My backup one is this lovely shot of the wizard when he's near the end of his very heated conversation with Bentley. And I call this one. I'm not crazy because <laughs> he is open mouth. <laughs> commanded yeah. Bentley to do something, put it on. He's got spittle coming out of his mouth. Yeah, and frothing. he looks nuts. Yeah, he's unhinged. He looks he's very C-R-A-Z-Y unhinged. nuts. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. What do you have for your... <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, my top joke one is on page 11, and I call it Big Eyes, Clear Shot, Can't Miss. And this is after Val... Put the final drink into the wizard. She's standing up on a roof with a smoking gun that shot a drink dart at the wizard. And I just, she's got giant eyes that occupy a third of her head. And it's just nice to see her with a, a drink rifle. <laughs> Crack me up. Those, are, those aren't her eyes. Those are goggles, my friend, aren't they? No, those are her eyes, which are the size of goggles. You can zoom in on that. You know what? That You're right. You're right. Iris and whites and pupils. I thought she was wearing safety goggles, but no, you're right. Those are her <laughs> no. eyes. No, a third of her head is occupied by her visual organs. All right. My top joke one is go for the goal. Do I need to say anything else? It's... Oh, uh, yeah. It made me laugh, and it also was very cathartic, too. It's just... He to the uprights. Oh, he is, he is up in the air, mm-hmm. just putting full force into that, and get bed, dad. Yeah. We're going to come back to that line, too. (laughs) All right. 
What else do you have there? For my backup, on page seven, I call it Rocket Roddy. And this is the introduction of their intercontinental ride that they take, which is a mechanized Roddy horse. And that's why they need helmets, because you need helmets to be flying at ludicrous speeds through the atmosphere. <laughs> on a glorified hobby horse, yes. <laughs> yep, it is a glorified hobby horse. It is it had a lot of work done to it. It is ship of Theseus, but it is still her hobby horse. My backup best art is the fight in the cafeteria. It is a uh, one my... full pager. It is some Johnny blasting some aim agents. It's Spider-Man shooting his webbing. It's the thing swinging his fist and yep. tables and food and aim suited guys are going everywhere. That's my top one. I called it cafeteria kerfuffle. Animal House got nothing on this one. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Food fight, baby. Food fight. All right. What do you have? Although that was it for you. My top one is the last page, the last image. And I just say, how cute. It's this, yeah, it's a nice sunrise. It's this really nice sunrise over these tops of buildings with Val and Bentley holding hands. And it's it's a nice picture it's a nice well done picture that we can just see these two kids who are going to do world domination so there we go yeah it's it's the end of fight club except yeah, it's less buildings blowing up mm-hmm. a, 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 a giant faraway explosion is in their view the sun the sun rubber and glow moment what was the best or most childish insult my backup one she'll thank me later when she learns what it means to cross the little yellow boogers Remember what they left in <laughs> Bentley's bed last week? That's Alex talking to Dragon Man, explaining his logic for mm. for doing what he did in throwing the ping pong game. Little yellow boogers. <laughs> it's, that's a good one. That is a great one. Yeah, mine is just before that, page three, the first page. And it is after Onami is looking like she's going to win the ping pong. And you have the Moloids going, she devil, disaster, Mick. Total Calamity core. yes, we've never faced match point before. Indeed, it seems our long reign of ping-pong dominance teeters on the precipice. And Bentley, who's just watching the game, eating a hamburger, is like, you guys have played like four times ever. No mercy on me. <laughs> and I love that. It's just like, they're not experts at ping-pong. They just have had a run yeah. for yeah. first-timing luck, because we're a bunch of brain nerds and not a bunch of ping-pongers. So... <laughs> The two things can coexist. It can totally coexist, but yeah, I think it's just funny. It's three people playing against one person. So, yeah, there's a chance that three people versus one. And yet they still are losing. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, Onomi's awesome. Onomi, Onomi kicks it. And She's these guys great. suck. <laughs> they feel, yeah, that's why they get three on their side. My top one, I said it before, was Gent Bent Dad. Mm -hmm. The insult is what he's doing where he's kicking him in the nuts but yep. i just like the get bent dad i mean he get is bent, dad. there's a lot that's there and i really liked it so i had to give it some he's rebuking thy father and forgetting his name so yes what do you have for your top one my top one is after the game gets finished and bentley while eating what might be an ice cream sandwich or something says so close and onami's response is yeah well i think they cheated and he says not my point <laughs> I love this because what he was trying to do here is have her pull winning off of him or whatever petty revenge that the Moloids have. And he's just like, if she had won the game, they would have shifted their petty focus to her and I'd have been scot-free. So he's like, <laughs> ah, so close. <laughs> People might not have any idea what he's talking about unless you figure out what he's talking about. Or it's just like, he's just trying to move heat. Oh, he's a tricky bugger. Good job, kiddo. That cracked me up. Speaking of tricky buggers, let's go ahead and talk about Parent of the Year Award, the Reed Richards Award for Good Parenting. And I'm going to go ahead and say Reed Richards gets his own award for Good Parenting. I think that we see his conversation with the wizard and how he's treating Bentley in this with mm -hmm. giving Bentley the opportunity to face his quote unquote father. Mm -hmm. I think that that was all handled really, really well. And I yes. like how Reed has... I am raising him well. And like we're saying, a lot of work done in the white space panels, <laughs> but I'm raising him my way. And he's turning out better than he would have with you. Mm -hmm. He's raising him with his peers in a place where he can be, where he can grow out of who destiny has painted him as. So I like what 
Reed has done here. And I think that it is good parenting skill that he is doing for this child. I'm definitely going to give him the award for that. I agree. I agree. I agree. It's not who I went with. I'm going to go for the opposite version of Reed's award and give it to his oldest adversary ever. His once and future foe, his opposite side of the coin, his joker to his penguin. I don't know DC very well. I think that's right. Anyway, I'm giving it to the wizard. I'm, he's a bad parent. <laughs> Absent dad award. Yeah, very absent dad, but when he's there, he's stark raving mad. So yeah, not too great. Not, not too, too great, great at all. So I give the bad parenting to the wizard. All right, let's go ahead and get to popular and shunned. Who is the best and who is the worst in the series? We are a power pack podcast, and we do like mm -hmm. to find out where our kids are at and what they're doing. And I got to say right now, Alex, you're kind of bad. I'm going to go ahead mm. and say, you know, even though there's nice parallels between what he's doing and and what Reed's doing. And there's a lot of things going on. You know, let her find out and fight her own battles. The only way Anume is going to know who these people are is if she figures out who they are by doing what she does and mm -hmm. standing up for herself. Let her figure it out for herself. Don't get involved. Don't get involved unless you need to. You didn't need to get involved. Hmm. That's an interesting choice. I am going to have not thought about that one. I'm going to say Moloids just because they're petty vindictive, vengeful loser characters who they talk a big game and then they do petty little things. Well, so what you're saying is they're like me. Well, if the vengeance soaked robe of disappointment fits. By the way, you owe me a new robe. Anyways, <laughs> who do you have for your best? <laughs> I'm going to give it to Reed for the reasons that you had mentioned for the good parent. That's fair. I'm actually going to go with Bentley because... Mm -hmm. It had to be tough. It had to be tough going oh, into yeah. that room to face the wizard and to stand up to him and to say, no, I'm not going down this path. You cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I like where I'm at. Yeah. I like the fact, too, that he he's talking to Val beforehand. Mm -hmm. Like, Reed's all like, you don't have to go in here if you don't. And Val's talking him up. It's like, you're going to do awesome. You know what you need to do. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I do. But I'm going to go talk to my dad. And he's going to be who he is. And who he is is me. Yeah. And so that aspect that he was still willing to go in and kind of still try and do like a need something to hold on to. Here's your helmet. We all agree this is something you could focus on. It might be able to keep you closer to where you need to be. And he's just yep. raving and raving and raving. The wizard cracked me up, too, because when he's spouting off at Reed going, you're the past, I'm the future. And the only way to get to the future is to move to the past. I'm not striking down your belief system. I'm smiting it. And it's like, dude, smiting is striking. You've are just uh, your cuckoo. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's go ahead and move on and talk a little bit more about grades, top grades, where we want to put this issue in our ever-growing list. We have Fantastic Four Month of Morning still at number one. We have, rounding off the top 10, the last issue we talked about, FF Volume 1, number 19, Safari. Down spot number 34, we have Avengers Academy Final Exam Part 1. And down to spot number 52, we have Avengers Academy number 39, The Commencement. Spot number 70, we have FF Volume 1, number 21, Ronance. I kind of just skipped through different places because I was yeah, like that. Fun. So I like this one. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. good layers to it. It's a quick little story. It's a fast read. Better than Ronance. So definitely above 70. Well, yeah. I'm having a hard time figuring out where I want to drop this one. All right, we have the Founding of Future Foundation at spot number 19. We have Avengers Academy 21, First Day of School, where Jocasta goes boom. Ooh. Spot number 16, Ben drinks a serum and he becomes human in Fantastic Four number 584. It has been a little while. There was a lot of joy that Ben got to have in that. I'm kind of looking at spot 20, mm -hmm. the loners number four, where Julie becomes an actress for a hot second. Okay. For whatever reason, that's kind of feeling in the area. 16 is close to 20, so, I mean, it could be fairly malleable about where I think it could go. I think that this could go between 19 and 20. We have the Foundation yeah. of the Future Foundation, which is seminal, and when Julie becomes an actress. Mm -hmm. I do like that one. That's a good one with Julie. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a good one. But yeah, this has got a little... It's more... It's re recency bias, but also it, it's got a good amount of stuff going for it right now. I could, Yeah, new 20. All right, we can do that. We can do that. All right, that will be the new number 20 then. Let's mm -hmm. go ahead and talk about our final thoughts about Rogue Knuckle Buster Beer. Mm -hmm. Let's. 
I have an opinion. I have a voice. Yeah. Uh, you have not drank much of that. I... Oh, man. Every time I do, I am fighting my face still. I will finish this beverage because I have a, a stick-to-it attitude and believe in myself. I am not finding it very pleasant. It's not the worst thing we've had. We have no. had tire fires before, but I am not really enjoying this. I'm going to give it a, a very strong two. Ooh, I can see where you're coming from with that, too. It is rough on me. This is a rough beverage. I understand it. I don't like hops. This is a low-ranking beer for me. I'm trying to put my hops blinder on and say, mm -hmm. would I like this if I enjoyed hops? <laughs> <laughs> I think I would enjoy it more if I if I liked hops. I think that if you really enjoy hops beer, this would be really good. Because I will say it's very consistent. Oh, it is. It is not changed at all. Well, it's consistently harsh on my taste buds. It is something I do recognize that other people would like. And so I, I have a hard time really hitting it for that. I'm going to go ahead and say it's a three. But for somebody who probably likes IPAs more than I do or we do, it would definitely be higher. Your mileage is definitely going to vary on this one. I'm just going for how much I'm fighting it every time I take a sip. I want a beverage to be a drinking experience and not something where I'm kind of quasi forcing myself to do it and not and I don't feel like I have to fight it. And then I forget that it was a drink and it was just a like a, a facial expression. So So it's kind of like recording this podcast with me then. Yes. It's, Fair enough. No, except I might not ever have to have this beer again. So I think I like this beer better now. No. <laughs> I love doing this podcast with you. I love spending the time with you, I guess talking and discussing and having a drink while we do it. You know what else I like? What? I like Kid's Perspective, and that's where you talk to your 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, about the issue that we just covered. So, Rick and Carrie, take it away. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Daddy. We are back to talk about FF number 22, right? That's two twos. Two twos. Two twos. What do you think about this issue? What was this issue about? I'd say it's about dads and... No, I'd say it's about Bentley. It's about fathers and sons. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad I have you as a father. Not some evil <laughs> mastermind that cloned me. Well, I mean, there are things I might not have told you yet. I could still be an evil mastermind and you could be a clone. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I don't force you to wear helmets. Well, actually, I do. You do have to wear a helmet when you ride your bike, but still. Yeah, actually, it's you the one who's like mostly not wearing helmets and I'm the one who has to tell you to put. On the helmet. Yeah, well, that's how I was raised. Kind of like reversed, reversed, reversed. Yeah. Did you like this issue? Yeah, it was kind of off the weird war thing that was happening. Two issues. We've moved beyond that one, and this is uh, more of a standalone issue dealing with the wizard. Kind of more of a personal one. At the beginning, I wasn't really sure what to think because there's ping pong and betrayal and sneaking off. And <laughs> then there was this like really dramatic moment with Bentley and his father. Shows how different and amazing Bentley can be when he's not a jerk face evil kid. And that was kind of neat. It's perspective because, yeah. yes, he is a jerk face and yes, he is a little evil. But comparatively speaking... Looking at the wizard, how he is supposed to be raised and what he's supposed to be like. Bentley is a pretty good kid. Yeah. he. I mean, he has his moments, but he does work with the Future Foundation. And yeah. he knows that he does not want to be the wizard. Yeah. He does not want to be Whitman. Yeah. And in that one moment, I actually liked Bentley. Yeah. And you're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Which is good. You're supposed to look at him and say, he has been given an opportunity and he has grown with that opportunity so yeah and during that opportunity he fell in love with val who's apparently a three-year-old in this story yeah the ages change a bit she was four and then she was three <laughs> she acts like a 59 year old i mean what can it's I really say? hard to tell it's yeah. really hard to tell the idea being that they are cut from the same cloth and there is a relationship that exists there they're both kind of mischievous and i think right. it works out Without somebody like Val, even though she is her own brand of evil, Bentley might not be as successful. Bentley needs Val. He needs Reed Richards. He needs all of the members of Future Foundation there to help him be more than he should be. Yeah. Pretty cool? Yeah. This was a really nice personal comic. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. We enjoyed this one, too. Anything else about it you want to talk about or bring up? Um, 
No, not really. All right. Then thank you very much for your time, Carrie. Okay. I love you. Love you too. Hmm. I don't know, Carrie. I could see you kicking your dad right in the helmet if he uh, left it laying in the street. You'd probably do that. No, no, she really wouldn't. She's too good of a kid. I don't know what I'm going to do about that. Shout out time. We'd like to recognize those listeners that take the time to write in, leave us a review, or just say hi to us. And we need more of you to say hi to us on social media. I know it's social media, but it'd be nice. Yeah, we're lonely. I do want to say thank you to these fine people like Hoover Jeremiah. Jeremy Daw who said, what a fun-looking cover. I can't wait to listen to the episode. Oh, I wanted to tell you fellas I met Sam De La Rosa at my local comic convention last week. He had a lot of his work on Venom and Carnage for his display at his booth. Ah, of course, had to compliment his work on the Thanksgiving issue of Power Pack. Sam looked a bit taken aback by my compliment and told me that Luis is a gem of a writer and editor while he enjoyed his work with Walt. I got an autographed print from him, commemorating Spider-Man issue number 700, which is now on my wall. I thought you guys would enjoy this bit of news. I do. I think that's awesome. That's awesome. We love hearing about people meeting people who've worked on Power Pack. I know I'm really jealous of Colin Stapleton. He went to Baltimore Comic Con this last weekend, and he got to see the Simonsons and June Brinkman, and I was jealous. So next year, I'm going to go to Baltimore City Comic Con. That'll learn him. That'll learn somebody. <laughs> I also like to thank Sean Ross. And I would like to thank Tim Price, the Podcrasher, and his show, The Outcasters. We also like to thank those people that give us a few bucks over on Patreon. And that includes adorably astonishing and amazing Andrew Burns. Cheerfully cheeky and charming Char Logan. Challenging, cheesy, and chuckling Charles Gears. Destructive and devastatingly delightful Damian Witter. Dynamically dangerous and devious Doug Jones. Intelligent, interesting, and innovative Isaac Perry. Jaunty, jubilant, and jazzy Jeff Osterreiter. Jesting, joking, and jovial Jeff Polier. Just jealous and jeweled Jeremy Da. Muscly, mighty, and meticulous Matthew Birdsey. Mythical and magnificent monologuing Matthew Lazowitz. Steely, salty, and steamy Sailor Bear Zodar. Sad and sickeningly silly Shag Matthews. Tyrannically terrifying and tame Tim Price. Way, way wordy and wobbly Waffles. Next issue, we're going to cover FF number 23. Run. Be sure to check out my daughter's comic strip on our website. Just do a search for Jeff and Rick present Tales of Tales. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff and Rick present is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recording for a live studio audience in Portland, Oregon. If you would like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so through Blue Sky at Jeff and Rick present, our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick present, our email address, Jeff and Rick present, all one word at gmail.com, or at our website, Jeff and Rick present dot WordPress dot com. Also, we have a YouTube channel at Jeff and Rick present. And if you'd like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com, Jeff and Rick present all one word. We are also a proud supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we'll be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We, we love, love you. you. Until next time. Costumes off. Our theme music is 80s action by Kevin McLeod. Also featured in this episode is Cyber Trooper, the better version. All music is found at thecopycut.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. I was going to do the same exact voice and then you did that, so I did my hey, voice. Hey, perfect. That works out. Ba boom. Why do I keep taking sips of this beer? I don't know. Ah, here we go. Ba boom. Try to paint Reed as an ancient abacus at Rhythmatase. Arithmetizer. 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 Ba-boom! Long story short, this was a long game by Ames... Nah.